I am uh, Senator Campanin, Chair of the Health Committee for New York State Senate, and uh, also we do the, the budget, which has been expanded to a number of other related areas to health, such as mental health and substance abuse. Um, and we are um, just uh, getting a great chance to have a con uh, conversation, presentation, with our Medicaid director, Jason Helgerson, who um, I was looking over trying to find his biography. I couldn't find his biography on Google last night because there were so many articles about the policies that uh, are being undertaken in the state. Um, suffice it to say, from memory, um, Jason uh, came from Wisconsin, where he'd been Medicaid director under uh, the uh, enlistment of Andrew Cuomo, and was given the charge um, to really start shaking things up, especially in the context of this was a state in 2011 facing an $11 billion budget deficit. We had been facing uh, double-digit growth in Medicaid, and uh, the question was, how are we going to change things around? And instead of just adopting um, the usual budgetary tools of slashing your rates, uh, retroactive, um, all sorts of things, um, Governor Cuomo decided to try to get into avoiding the TV air wars that was going on, enlisted uh, many of the participants in the healthcare community in the state, and uh, led by Jason, formed the Medicaid redesign team which um, has been extraordinarily successful for the premises that it was established and um, extraordinarily transparent, but uh, is so much to it, especially with a $53 billion a year program, that all of the suggestions for change, the actual changes, the implementation of those changes, and dealing with the bumps along the road have been um, uh, more than a full-time job. So we want to talk about that today. I had a sneak peek at uh, uh, Jason's uh, slides, and I know there's, there's a lot new, um, but it also there's a need to go over and uh, uh, repeat a little bit about what we've done, where we've been, um, because that's very important. Not everybody has a chance to do uh, all of that at the same time. Before I start, continue, I just want to uh, acknowledge my colleagues in government, uh, Ed Ra and Dave McDonough are here, the assembly uh, men from this area, and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we're also representatives from Assemblyman Levine's office and uh, Senator Chuck Fischillo's office. Thanks for being here. You know, it's not just Medicaid. Uh, we deal a lot with health, and there's a lot of other things taking place, such as the I-STOP, which on the 27th of August is supposed to be uh, being initiated, a new requirement for all doctors giving prescriptions for controlled substances. At the end of this month also, we're expecting to hear from the folks doing the New York uh, Health Exchange, which sometimes in Washington they now call the marketplace. Um, there's going to be a readiness review that's supposed to be published, and we're all waiting to see how that will go about. And, uh, but at the meantime, the focus, the longer-term focus uh, for this state is Medicaid. And uh, I'm not going to get into it. There's a number of cutting-edge things that are going to be taking place at some point. The waiver, the movement of patients in nursing homes into managed care, and uh, continuing Im implementation of dealing with uh, uh, the care and the payment for people who are duly eligible for Medicaid and Medicare, a very challenging problem. Um, but I'm not going to uh, do the speech. Jason is. He's had to do the design, implementation, take care of the bumps, and doing a lot of the missionary work um, to Washington, where CMS um, had until his coming a very jaundiced view of New York. We spent more, uh, and uh, we, we didn't always play um, as, as uh, easily as one ought to play when you're trying to get the approval of bureaucrats. With that being said, I'm going to let Jason start, and thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Hofstra, for being our host today. Well, it certainly is a pleasure to be here today on Long Island, uh, Nassau County, to talk about Medicaid redesign. 
I want to just begin by uh, thanking Senator Hannon for inviting me to be here today. So the senator has been a tremendous partner in our Medicaid redesign efforts. Um, the, what I'll be talking about today, none of it would have been possible uh, if it were not for the New York State Legislature and particularly the leadership of, of Senator Hannon and his colleague in the Assembly, uh, Assemblyman Gottfried, the chair of the Assembly um, Health Committee. Uh, I've been around politics and government uh, for going on 20 years, uh, and I don't think I've ever had a better working relationship uh, with the chairs of, of uh, assembly or uh, legislative committee uh, or committees uh, than I have here today. So I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to be here. I'm also appreciative because, as the senator said, there's a lot going on with Medicaid redesign, and probably one of the biggest challenges we collectively face is making sure that the stakeholders, those affected who work in these programs, uh, work for the population on a daily basis. That I'm a big believer that the better that everyone understands what it is we're trying to do, uh, what the how various initiatives fit together, um, the better that we all understand that, uh, the more likely we are to be successful. And that a lot of times uh, the biggest challenges, the roadblocks, the uh, speed bumps that occur in implementation are a direct result of an inability to effectively communicate. And it's hard in a state as large and diverse as this one uh, with a program that has a, such a significant impact on the lives of so many people as well as on the actual economy itself uh, that it's often hard to, to get that communication flow uh, out in an appropriate way. And one of the things I see as part of my job uh, is to uh, come to events like this to talk about what we're all trying to accomplish and then hopefully, and we'll have time at the end, to answer questions uh, on any one of the, the myriad of things I talk about uh, or on other questions that are top of everyone's minds. So in terms of the agenda, I um, thought it would make sense to do a little um, uh, where have we been, uh, what is our results to date discussion about implementation of the Medicaid redesign team. Um, plan. Um, we've now been at Medicaid Redesign for a little over two and a half years. Uh, so we're now beyond a point um, of just talking about what we're going to do and getting to a point where we're now talking about what has actually happened. Uh, so I've got some, some data, some information that we can share about that, um, and both on the cost side of the equation as well as on quality. Uh, when the governor created the Medicaid Redesign team, he tasked the, the, uh, uh, the team with th that twofold task of both lowering costs and improving quality, uh, which I believe is uh, fundamentally possible in New York State, and I got some evidence, some, in some cases on the quality side, a little early, uh, but our, I think point to the fact that we are beginning to see some real success in both those areas. Next, I'm going to talk about some of the major challenges as we look to 2014. 2014 is an extremely important year for us um, in Medicaid redesign, and I think more generally in healthcare, uh, not only is it the implementation of the health insurance exchange, which will be the uh, sort of the, the penultimate uh, element of the uh, Affordable Care Act being implemented in the 2014 timeframe. There are also some very significant Medicaid redesign elements that are going to go into effect in 2014, and we want to, I want to talk about that as well. And then next is major outstanding policy questions. Um, while we have, as a result of the MRT's uh, actions, which really met for uh, about a year, uh, the final result of that process was a five-year action plan, and we are halfway into implementing that plan. But that said, um, there were issues that were left unresolved, questions that remain in terms of um, policy design moving forward. Uh, and I've been, part of my travels around the state have been to try to raise these policy questions with a variety of different audiences to begin to get folks from across the state thinking about these questions as we look forward to 2014 and beyond. And then lastly, as I said, happy to answer questions from the audience. So implementation today, are we in fact lowering costs and improving outcomes? So far, bending the cost curve, I believe, and I'll show you some slides in a minute, I think we've been very successful at bending the cost curve in Medicaid. Uh, we now, are, as I say, are at a point where we've actually looked at actual expenditures, not just projections of expenditures as a result of the various initiatives uh, that, that we have launched. Uh, to date, MRT, which really has been rolled out in, in multiple phases, uh, we're actually in the midst of implementation of phase three of MRT, has generated over 200 initiatives that are in some stage of implementation or in the case of many of our first wave, almost all of our first wave initiatives have already been implemented. Uh, in our first year alone, we reduced total Medicaid expenditures by about $4 billion. And for the last two years, we have managed to live with underneath the nation's only Medicaid global spending cap, which is a, 
a dollar um, cap, uh, both for this year and for next, um, uh, in an actual dollar cap on the state share of Medicaid expenditures for roughly about 90% of the Medicaid program. Uh, particularly services uh, provided within the developmental disability system are outside of the cap, as well as a, a small subset of the behavioral health services are outside the cap. But generally, the vast majority of the program is under this global cap, and so far, at least, we've been able to live within it. In fact, last year, we finished $200 million under the cap. To give you a sense of what $200 million means is that the growth we were allowed uh, for uh, last fiscal year was about $600 million, which is equivalent to about 4% of uh, uh, total spending uh, growth, or basically it's 4% uh, spending growth. Uh, so we basically were able to live without a third of the allowed growth. Uh, that was really important uh, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, we had a significant budgetary challenge going into this last budget that was associated with the replacement of a 20 plus year old system for financing developmental disability services, a system that had been approved by our colleagues at the federal government uh, about uh, 27 times over the past 20 plus years, uh, but that there was determination that that f uh, funding system was no longer appropriate and had to be replaced. Uh, and we had to replace it April 1st, so the beginning of our state fiscal year. Uh, the result of that uh, change led to a loss of $1.1 billion in federal revenue. That was enough to double the size of the budget deficit, uh, and the governor's uh, amended budget uh, addressed that deficit. Um, but it was a very significant challenge, one that was sort of, as I always say, it was like an albatross uh, of sort of hanging around our our necks as we proceeded down this path of Medicaid redesign, knowing that at some point or another this issue is going to have to be addressed. And the good news is on a perspective basis we were able to address it and to a great extent we were able to absorb this loss because Medicaid redesign from a cost containment standpoint has actually exceeded expectations. Um, and we'd be in a very, very different situation if we had not uh, seen that uh, outcome. We would have, uh, as the Senator mentioned, gone back probably, because we had no choice, back to the old way of doing business, which was to make some pretty uh, devastating provider rate reductions or having to look at the benefits that members get or other types of service limitations. Um, we were able to avoid that uh, because of the myriad of init individual initiatives that are part of that five-year plan that they are generating significantly more savings uh, than had originally been anticipated within the state financial plan. Uh, and then lastly, when you, when you look at the charts, I think you'll see that a lot of the savings that's being generated in Medicaid redesign is being generated in New York City. Uh, I guess probably not a surprise to many. Um, New York City obviously is the locus of most, or not most, but of the largest share of any uh, particular um, uh, part, part of our state of Medicaid resources. Um, but we did have some particularly unique problems too that were associated with New York City, particularly in the non-institutional long-term care area uh, that uh, MRT was very effective uh, at addressing. Uh, and that was a big reason why uh, we've been able to exceed expectations from a savings standpoint. So what I'm going to show you are a series of, uh, of charts. These are my bending the cost curve charts. Um, this first chart is for New York State spending, um, total statewide uh, Medicaid spending for those uh, that element of the program, 90% of total, that is underneath the global spending cap. What these lines show is what the trend was based on her historic level compared to what actually occurred uh, over the last two calendar years. And I'm using calendar years just to deal with claims run out and other types of issues to make sure that you're looking at an apples to apples comparison. But what you can clearly see is that beginning in 2011, and if you remember, we only had really three quarters of that calendar year to work with because the budget that was at the first MRT uh, installation of initiatives did not occur until April 1 of 2011. So we didn't have the full impact, but you see the full impact of MRT in calendar year 12. And what you see really for the first time since 2006 is a dollar, a year on year dollar reduction in Medicaid spending statewide in New York State. Uh, at the same time that this occurred, uh, the Medicaid program has continued to grow in enrollment. Um, in fact, since MRT began, we've added almost 500,000 people to the Medicaid program. Uh, and so as a result, that has put more pressure on us to generate uh, per recipient uh, cost savings. Uh, and I think that it, it shows that uh, from uh, improving the efficiency of the program, I think we're making significant strides because we're able to reduce on a year-by-year -year basis actual spending, not just changes in trend, um, but actual spending at the same time we're adding 
hundreds of thousands of people to the program. As to give you a sense, if we just have projected out the trend we inherited and compared that to where actual spending is today, uh, our annualized savings across the state is $4.6 billion a year. This chart is for New York City, and I think what you can see here is that the bending of the cost curve is even more uh, significant. Um, and uh, what you can see is that the vast majority of that anticipated savings, uh, or the, of, the, of the savings we have compared to trend, uh, I mentioned it was 4.6 billion um, in uh, statewide, 3.2 billion of that is for New York City alone. Um, and I think to a great extent, uh, that savings has been generated through um, some important initiatives, particularly in long-term care. And this is to give you a sense of the, the cost trend growth that we had seen in, in, in the not too distant past uh, in long-term care spending. What I want to emphasize is if you uh, actually look at the number of recipients served throughout, you see relatively flat enrollment in these long-term care programs throughout the period, yet you see every year until the last couple of years, continued growth in expenditure. When the governor took office in his very first budget speech, he outlined this, this as a major challenge, these, particularly the non-institutional long-term care services, where the, the link between the needs of the members and the amount of money being spent had been completely lost. Uh, and it was driving, this was, this was the number one cost driver in the Medicaid program uh, when MRT began. And I think through a number of initiatives, including the move to managed care, which is ongoing, uh, we are uh, really beginning to see some significant savings uh, in the program. And that was the chart. All right, so cost savings is one part of the MRT mission. The other part, of course, is improving the quality of outcomes. And we have, well, traditionally what happens is that the quality data tends uh, to lag behind, takes sometimes longer periods of time to get that data in a clean form or to have an outside entity come in and do an evaluation. But the good news is we are beginning to see um, some uh, measures, some inf information, some data that is suggesting that we are in fact improving uh, some outcomes. I can talk about that. So first off, um, I think if anyone knows, uh, or has spent any time looking at our, um, our plan for redesigning the Medicaid program in New York, will know that we are moving to a care management for all strategy, which means that over the next several years, uh, we will be uh, basically, and have in fact been doing this uh, pretty aggressively over the last two, two years, moving services and individuals from fee-for-service into managed care. We've made some very significant uh, um, uh, moves in that uh, direction already, uh, and there are more moves to come, which I'll talk about um, not too long from now. But the question is, what kind of managed care program do we have in New York State? Can we trust managed care providers to be really responsible for managing not only their existing population, but some even more complex individuals uh, and more complex services that historically they have not had to deal with in the past. Uh, and that's an honest and fair question that a lot of people ask. Can we trust these plans? And interestingly, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, which is sort of the, the nationwide um, uh, evaluator of quality in managed care, uh, did a recent study and found that New York State ranks second in the nation in terms of Medicaid managed care, second only to Massachusetts in terms of the quality of care provided through Medicaid managed care plans. Uh, in fact, the study found that these plans were particularly good in managing some of the most common and costly diseases, in particular diabetes, childhood obesity, uh, the need for smoking cessation, and also follow-up care for the mentally ill. Um, to me, this um, study that came out in late 2012 um, is uh, I think a positive sign for the model we are pursuing. Does it mean that the plans um, uh, don't need to work very, very hard to take on these new populations and new services, and then we have to watch the plans very closely as we move each of these new populations into managed care? The answer is we still have to do all of that uh, as we did before, but I do feel this study does validate the idea that Medicaid managed care can be effective uh, in New York State and has in fact been effective. Now the question is, as we move these populations in, can we ensure that that, um, that effectiveness uh, is maintained and where there are issues that arise, we need to move quickly uh, to address those issues. Next is managed long-term care. This is probably one of the most significant changes that is literally going on as we, uh, as we speak today. In New York City, here on Long Island, uh, Westchester County, we are in the process of moving people from fee-for-service long-term care, home community-based first, and eventually the nursing home population into managed long-term care plans. 
Um, since in, over the last uh, year or so, we've added, increased that enrollment in that program by close to 90,000 people. Uh, and, uh, and enrollment growth continues at a, at a clip of about three to 4,000 a month. Um, it's led to a significant change in the way services are provided. Uh, it has had a little, some of its uh, challenges, but I think overall the transition, which has occurred far faster, and I think with fewer um, bumps than many had feared, um, has been successful. Uh, it certainly has been a key reason why that earlier chart in New York City, where most of the enrollment growth has occurred, uh, has uh, why we've been able to bend the cost curve uh, in long-term care services. Uh, in addition, it's a program that a recent evaluation found, uh, one that was done in late 2012, found that um, this was a program that um, had amazingly high satisfaction among program participants. In fact, it found that 85% of uh, members rated their plan as good or excellent, 91% would recommend it to a friend. Uh, and in addition to just overall customer satisfaction, two of the most important measures that you look for in long-term care are, are the plans doing a good job of keeping people out of nursing homes? The answer is less than 2% of, of uh, all managed long-term care members are in nursing homes, uh, so they are keeping people in the community effectively. And then secondly, overall functional ability. Uh, managed care uh, in long-term care should really be about improving the overall uh, functional status of the people they serve or at the very least maintaining it. Um, and what was found was that over 90% of MLTCP members had their functional status maintained or enhanced uh, over the last year. So we think that while there, there were still in early days, um, it is, um, and this program was not mandatory at the time that this study was done, that we do feel like the model itself is a good model of care. It can be a popular model. It provides actual additional services uh, that aren't available in the traditional fee-for-service world. Uh, so we think at the end of the day, it's a model we can build off on, and but we'll have to continue to evaluate it very closely. Another major care management strategy that we're launching, and I sometimes say this strategy is one of the most complex things we're trying to do, is what's called health homes. Our effort there is to try to create a team of providers, somewhere between 30 and 50 different organizations coming together in a geographic area. And what we're doing to that team uh, is we're assigning them some of our highest cost non-disabled members uh, that we have. To give you a sense of the challenges some of these members have, we looked at, of those who've been assigned to health homes so far, we looked at the 100 most expensive individuals from a Medicaid expenditure standpoint the year prior to their enrollment in um, a health home. And we found that for those 100 individuals, we spent $50 million. Uh, that's $500,000 per person, and most of that was in the form of inappropriate um, uh, hospitalizations, ER visits, detox, uh, ho yeah, hospitalizations for things that were um, treatable in a community setting or if their chronic illnesses were better managed, uh, they would not have needed those hospitalizations. Um, we think this, this initiative, while challenging to try to get these 30 to 50 organizations to come together, many of whom have seen each other as competitors in the past, to work together as a team, sharing information in real time, really helping patients navigate this complex system and breaking down the silos that historically have occurred between the behavioral health side of the, of the continuum with the physical health side of the continuum, um, and trying to break down those silos is, is really the point of health homes. Uh, and while it's still new and early, uh, we do have some results we can share. This is for a subset of individuals in, who are continuously enrolled uh, into, into health home. And what we're beginning to see is reductions in inpatient utilization. Uh, lots of fluctuation in the data. Frankly, to really assess the impacts of health homes, we're going to have to look at this on a longitudinal basis. Uh, so it's something we need to, uh, we'll be looking at in the, in the years to come. But so far, at least, on the, in, on the inpatient side, we're beginning to see some results. This is the ER utilization, down even steeper um, than before. Obviously, a key measure will be to the extent to which we're migrating people away from the emergency room into primary care, into other forms. Uh, of, of community-based treatment. That is certainly the goal of, for, for health homes. Um, but we are beginning to see, for those who have been enrolled in these programs, beginning to see some of the kinds of changes in utilization that we were hoping for. So that's where we've been and what we have accomplished so far. Uh, I feel very good about the progress we are making. That said, we have some very significant challenges ahead of us, some implementations. Uh, that if not done well uh, will be extremely problematic, but if done well 
Um, and I like to think of myself as a glass half full, if not entirely full kind of person. So I like to think about it from a positive standpoint. Uh, if we are able to implement these uh, key 2014 initiatives effectively, I think we can really um, significantly not only improve the program from a cost efficiency standpoint, but also significantly improve the quality of life of some of the most challenged New Yorkers who live among us. Um, so in terms of some of those um, significant implementations, that little thing called the Affordable Care Act, uh, which uh, we are running at 1,000 miles an hour uh, to uh, build this health insurance exchange and get it up and running so we can start offering uh, shopping opportunities for health insurance beginning in, 20, or beginning in October of this year, so very uh, close uh, at hand. Also, it's the MRT waiver amendment. This is uh, our effort to reinvest a portion of the federal savings that's occurring. So when I show those charts, always remember that half that savings that we're generating goes straight back to Washington under the current framework. And what we're asking for through the waiver is to keep some of that money here in New York so we can address some of the, the structural challenges we face in healthcare delivery, things that could benefit not just the Medicaid population, but potentially could benefit the entire state population uh, if we invest those uh, resources wisely. Next is the FIDA demonstration. This is um, a, a little thing where we're uh, proposing for about 170,000 duly eligible individuals uh, in this downstate region, so including here on Long Island is the idea of getting those individuals into fully integrated care and really systematically first for the first time in New York State bringing those two payers together so you actually can look at the whole needs of these complex and oftentimes very expensive um, uh, individuals uh, and trying to get better care coordination uh, across both payers. Very exciting potential um, but a lot of work ahead. And then next is um, behavioral health carbon uh, slash HARP, which is the health and recovery plan approach. This is also a significant uh, implementation. This is really to begin for the first time to systematically integrate behavioral health and physical health for uh, the Medicaid population. Uh, and it is also a, a very challenging, but I think very exciting potential opportunity. So first off, the Affordable Care Act. A million New Yorkers potentially getting health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. Um, but that said, it's a major challenge for us to get this thing up and running on the timeline that is available. I took great solace when the president held a press conference where he said there were going to be glitches uh, as the organization responsible for basically serving as the back office for the health insurance exchange and responsible for building uh, a computer system that no one's ever built before uh, to do all the things that the health insurance exchange is doing. Uh, I have great appreciation for the challenges associated with this particular project. Uh, and while it's almost certainly uh, there will be glitches in the implementation, I think the potential of uh, providing greater access uh, to health insurance is, is really tremendous. Uh, I think it's particularly from the Medicaid standpoint, as the Medicaid director, an opportunity for individuals as their income rises to not face a giant cliff effect of having to uh, potentially give up their access to health care uh, if they take a different job or they take a raise. Um, and the opportunity uh, for individuals who are employed uh, um, and have health insurance through a large employer but are very interested in going out and becoming entrepreneurs, uh, and, but are afraid because they have a family member who has a pre-existing condition. Um, I think it's particularly exciting to think about the fact that if we have a functioning health insurance exchange, people uh, will not face those disincentives uh, to do uh, better for themselves and their families, uh, and hopefully as a result, um, we'll see an economic benefit at the same time that we see a healthcare benefit uh, for more insured lives. Also, what's important is that we are in the process of really overhauling and replacing um, the state's 35, 40-year-old uh, eligibility system. I think one of the things that sort of has held us back, hampered us from a, a Medicaid reform standpoint, has been our reliance on a very old eligibility system. Uh, it's a mainframe-based system uh, with COBOL uh, as the language, uh, which has become increasingly difficult to maintain. Um, in fact, we're in the process of trying to recruit COBOL um, programmers. If anyone knows anyone, uh, chances are they're going to be uh, closing on retirement, if not already there, uh, because so few people, uh, no one's trained in these languages anymore. But, uh, but it is a, while it's a challenge to convert from one eligibility system to another, and it will be a sort of a steady conversion over time, it is a potentially very exciting option. Because instead of having to go to um, a county office to sign up for these programs, 
individuals will be able to sign up online from the comfort of their home, apartment, uh, or um, across the, across the uh, table from a community-based organization uh, uh, where uh, they are more likely um, to, to visit um, in order to access health insurance. I think eventually, too, other human service programs could migrate to the system, and for once and for all, we could put uh, WMS uh, out to pasture, uh, but there's uh, more work to be done there. What's also important is this is the beginning of the state takeover of Medicaid administration. as something that the legislature approved. It's no small task. It's actually a major structural change in the relationship between state and local government. Uh, right now, it's about 5,500 local workers across the state who do Medicaid administration, and those responsibilities, to the, to the most, for the most part, are going to, over the next five to six years, transfer to the state. Uh, and we're going to have to pick up that load, either ourselves uh, or through our contractors, whether those are our health plans uh, or other vendors, um, but we're going to be responsible for that. I do think, however, that um, considering the state spends about a billion dollars a year on Medicaid administration alone, that we can do it more efficiently on a centralized and automated basis, which is what the exchange uh, eligibility system will allow us to do. And I think at the end of the day, um, taxpayers will save, see savings as a result of that effort. So next, the MRT waiver amendment. As I said, this is our effort to reinvest a portion of federal savings back into a series of initiatives designed to both achieve the full aims of the Medicaid redesign team's action plan, as well as a, a mechanism for really preparing the state for the Affordable Care Act. While I believe to my core that the Affordable Care Act is the right health policy for the, for the United States, and I think that the million people getting health insurance is a wonderful thing, uh, the, the, the issue that uh, is real is whether or not we'll have enough providers, enough provider capacity out there to absorb that number of new individuals who are going to be giving health insurance cards uh, for the first time uh, and are going to go out with every expectation uh, that uh, they're going to be looking for services. Uh, and we have already uh, challenges in our delivery system. We have access problems in certain communities and in certain subspecialties. And the concern is, is that unless we are um, able to make some reinvestments, there's a serious concern uh, that we could have some, some real growing pains uh, as a result of um, uh, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. But you know what our challenges are, that little list there in red is probably no surprise to people in this room, whether it's the lack of primary care, the weak healthcare safety net, uh, whether that's in Brooklyn or in the North Country or in the Southern Tier, uh, or even right here on Long Island, we have providers who face significant challenges uh, and, uh, but are essential, um, and we need to find ways to strengthen, uh, uh, reform uh, those, in, those types of providers. Uh, we also have some significant health disparities. Uh, unfortunately, still in this state, uh, the, your, the color of your skin, of the neighborhood in which you grow up, uh, is uh, too, too often um, the, the primary determinant of your uh, health status, and we need to f uh, launch strategies to, to address that. And then lastly is transitions to managed care. Moving from fee-for-service to managed care is a big deal, for, particularly for many providers uh, who uh, are used to billing one entity, uh, are used to one set of financial incentives, and the managed care creates a whole new set of incentives. I think better incentives around better coordination, better management, uh, uh, better outcomes for members, um, but it does mean changes in the business model. It means, it means negotiating with health plans, and uh, we think the waiver could be a helpful tool as providers transition from that fee-for-service way of thinking into alternative payment models. I won't go into these in detail, but these are the areas that we've proposed for reinvestment. I think you'll see significant monies for primary care as well as uh, for those vital access providers. Uh, we also hope to invest in things like regional health planning, uh, an area where the state was really a leader uh, in the, in the, in the, particularly in the 1970s, uh, but then as funding eroded, uh, so did some of the health planning that occurred across the state. We do have some areas, uh, the Finger Lakes often mentioned, where planning continued even as the federal or the state funding uh, waned, but we think that we could relaunch um, uh, regional health planning and that as a result, we would get communities thinking about not just what their needs are today, but what their needs are uh, well into the future. I think this would be a great example of how Medicaid, um, as the biggest payer, could help ch change the nature of how care is delivered for the entire state population. Uh, regional health planning won't just benefit the Medicaid um, uh, population in a particular area, it would benefit the entire population. Next is the FIDA demonstration, or, or to get rid of the acronym, uh, the Fully Integrated Duels Advantage Demonstration Project. We are one of several states uh, that's working with the federal government 
uh, to move forward on this initiative. Uh, as I said, this is really an effort to sort of bring together um, uh, the two biggest payers uh, in the state, Medicaid and Medicare, for a subset of the duals uh, population. The subset we're talking about here is the individuals who are uh, initially those who are enrolled in home and community-based long-term care in the downstate region, um, uh, and eventually uh, the managed or the, the nursing home population will be um, enrolled into these fully integrated plans. These fully integrated plans actually will be already the plans we contract with as managed long-term care providers. Um, what we're asking the managed long-term care providers are to basically uh, expand the scope of the services that they provide and manage to include Medicare as well as the behavioral health benefits of, um, of Medicaid. Uh, and as is required under federal law, if someone is unhappy with the Medicare portion of the care management they're receiving, the network or other elements, uh, they will have the option of opting back into Medicare fee-for-service. We're obviously hoping that the opt-out rate will be low and that what you'll see is um, a significant portion um, of this population staying in the fully integrated managed care. To give you flavor for what this potentially means, uh, independent actuarial analysis was done uh, prior to MRT. It was released in 2010 by the actuarial firm uh, Milliman, uh, which determined that if you move the entire duals population in New York State into, into fully integrated uh, managed care, you could save a billion dollars a year. Um, and so this is really our first step, uh, moving uh, about 20% uh, of the total duals population into the, into the program. Uh, we're pursuing this uh, initiative uh, in a, we think, uh, responsible fashion, uh, trying not to take too much savings out of the system too quickly. In fact, we want, we're, we're going to be one of the first states to actually require that the plans to come up with shared savings agreements with their providers so that we can keep some of the savings, a lot of it particularly on the hospital side, back in the system. Because um, the one concern is that while we will be doing the right thing by the people, and getting them better care, better coordinated care, uh, we are going to be taking uh, revenues out of the system, and some of that revenue needs to be shared back uh, with the providers who are uh, directly impacted. Um, so it's um, something that will be launched in 2014. We're very excited about it, and we're in the final stages of uh, addressing the M memorandum of understanding with the federal government, uh, but we're getting uh, uh, very close. Um, I've got more slides on this probably than we have time for, but I do want to mention, because we're here on, uh, in Nassau County, that we do have one FIDA uh, here in the county that will um, be focused on the OPWDD population. Uh, I think as uh, people in the room may be aware, um, we are going through a significant system redesign for uh, people with developmental disability services, um, and part of that is the move to DISCOs. Uh, which is a form of managed care uh, that's akin to uh, the managed long-term care program, but obviously uh, uniquely tailored to meet the needs of the DD population. Uh, we also want that product to be eventually fully uh, integrated, uh, meaning that it will include the Medicare benefit for those who are duly in, um, enrolled. Uh, and we have one such pilot uh, that we are going to be launching here in the county. And so I will skip ahead just because there's... A lot, more, a lot more detail in there for you. So behavioral health. Another not so small uh, change in the nature of Medicaid. Historically, we've been, I would argue, probably one of the most uh, siloed states in the country when it came to behavioral health. And that siloization is not always a bad thing in the sense that um, that silo has um, effectively protected a lot of dollars in the behavioral health system uh, that in other states uh, just simply don't exist. Now, the downside of silo is that you tend to have a system and an entire regulatory regime uh, that is really separate from the physical health system. And, but at the same time, the individuals on the behavioral health side also have physical health challenges and vice versa. And so the problem is, is that those two sides, those two silos, un unfortunately, to, to a great extent, have not worked together, talked, shared information, or work together in common cause to meet the collective needs of that population. In addition, our managed care partners, while the majority, the vast majority, 80-90% uh, of this population already enrolled in managed care, um, the plans have never been really responsible for the deep end behavioral health services. Uh, it's really been left to fee for service uh, to reimburse those services. So not much of any incentive for them to go in and try to really actively manage to keep people out of those deep end behavioral health services. 
Uh, and so what we're proposing, and we're working very closely with the stakeholder group, in fact, uh, the Medicaid redesign team had created a series of work groups of which uh, one such group is behavioral health. That group has continued to meet continuously throughout um, the last uh, two and a half, or last uh, year and a half, even after MRT uh, uh, formally uh, uh, ended its work in December of 2011, and continued to be a, a source, a sounding board for us as we have honed these policies. But what was led to is sort of a two-part approach to behavioral health integration. Approach number one is to carve into the mainstream managed care plans the entire scope of the behavioral health benefit and hold them accountable for managing those services. Now we're doing that in ways that are providing protections to behavioral health providers and the behavioral health community, which is we are going to try to, in essence, lockbox that share of total capitation uh, in the behavioral health system. And in fact, what we want and we believe is going to happen is we're going to see physical health savings as a result of the behavioral health integration. And we want those, those, that savings to be made available for actual new investments into behavioral health services. Uh, so in addition to the behavioral health uh, carve-in, as we call it, into the mainstream benefit, we're also in the process of launching a new managed care product called HARPS, or Health and Recovery Plans. These plans, which will start in the city and in the downstate region, but potentially could expand across the state, is going to be a product specifically designed for individuals with significant persistent mental illness and in certain instances people with significant substance abuse uh, uh, challenges. The idea is that for this, I mean, we're talking about a population who's chronically in and out of uh, the, not only the hospital um, and particularly the emergency room, um, uh, but also as a population that's uh, a frequent user of the criminal justice system, uh, has many social needs, uh, and we believe that a specialized product with a specialized network and a very person-centric care management approach uh, is most likely to be successful for that population. And so we're actively working to, to build both those models um, moving forward. Um, this is a major transition. It affects almost 700,000 people and $7 billion is spent, which will migrate from fee-for-service to managed care. Um, and I, the stat that sort of blew me away is of the OASIS-funded services, so those Office of um, Alcohol and Substance Abuse uh, Services, about 70% of their total Medicaid-funded services are moving over as a result of that. Almost actually closer to 80% of the services will be a part of this migration. So as a result, um, we're, we're going to be seeing um, a significant transition in terms of responsibilities, the relationships between providers, the state, and plans, whole new sets of contracts that are going to have to be signed, individuals who are going to be impacted, uh, tremendous amount of work that's going to lead to this uh, implementation. But just thought I'd mention some of the guiding principles for all of this. We want it to be very patient-centered. We want there to be choice. Uh, we want the savings to be reinvested, um, particularly in the community-based system. One of the challenges that our OMH colleagues have is that they run uh, of the nation's largest uh, hospital-based uh, mental health system, a system that is underfunded uh, and, over and overstretched. Um, but part of the reason uh, that that system is what it is today uh, is because we don't have enough community-based options. And what we're um, hoping to do is as savings accrues from less hospitalizations uh, from managed care, we want to use that to build out the network and build out additional services. Uh, also important to point out is the opportunity for us to actually add benefits to the portfolio, to more systematically expand things that we know work, like peer support services, uh, to the benefit package and extend that service out to even more people than, than get it today. Also, I want to emphasize that one of the things that we're going to be breaking new ground on in behavioral health is making the responsibility, making it the plan's responsibility to help assist, particularly people with significant and persistent mental illness, help that population get into employment. A uh, major change in what we're going to be asking plans to do, but our belief is that uh, employment status is directly linked, and the empirical data I think is very clear, is very is directly linked uh, to, um, uh, to, the, to the overall health and, and health status of an individual. And if we can find a way to get more individuals into employment, uh, we think we're going to um, meaningfully bend the Medicaid cost curve. To give you a sense of the challenge that we face in this area is that roughly 80% of people in this state with significant and persistent mental illness are unemployed today. 
And that's a statistic to me that um, uh, is troubling at many levels, but I think also is potentially an opportunity for us uh, is if we think creatively and get plans to partner with entities, some of whom are already having success in employment in these areas, we create the right uh, incentives, we could potentially drive uh, people out of emergency rooms uh, and into employment. Right. I think I've covered most of this. This is the uh, timeline for uh, behavioral health integration. It's an aggressive one. Um, we're actually looking at the spring, um, uh, sorry, the spring 14 implementation. But at this point, we have not modified this timeline. So we are talking less than six months away from uh, fully deploying the, the carbon as well as launching uh, the, the HARPS. Um, and uh, um, we'll potentially go uh, outside of New York City, uh, the, the delay until uh, fall of 2014. And then on the kids' side, um, I know there's been lots of discussions around health homes and, and lots of discussion around uh, plans and integrated care for kids, particularly those in the foster care system. Still work to be done. I think we're finally beginning to make some progress here that we hope to uh, sort of finalize our plans uh, in the very near future. So, outstanding questions. Um, as I said, well, we have a five-year action plan and we are very serious about implementing that plan and we're about halfway there. We still uh, have some outstanding issues that need to be addressed as we move forward. Some of these were issues that we sort of anticipated may come, um, but now are much more clearly before us. And as I said, I've been trying to use this uh, summer as an opportunity to get around to folks to sort of get, the, at least plant these seeds, these questions, uh, so that we can collectively uh, try to think of uh, solutions for them. So question number one is, how will the state share uh, MRT savings with providers? So as I showed, we're beginning to bend the cost curve. Um, we had a, a good amount of savings this last year that we could have shared back, but obviously because of our challenges replacing the, the system for, for financing uh, DD services, much of that savings in essence uh, went back to the federal government, uh, much to our chagrin. But um, as the time goes on, as these various care management strategies continue to roll out, whether it's the FIDA demonstration, whether it's the uh, behavioral health integration, whether it's the continued move to manage care and long-term care, all of those um, uh, services, our anticipation, and I think the evidence today suggests that, this, that we are correct in this, are gonna generate further savings. And so fundamental at the end of the day, uh, underneath the global spending cap, uh, which uh, grants us, and I think to, I say this to the provider community in general, is the, the global spending cap is actually our friend as Medicaid director because what it means is that we know what our budget is this year and we know what our budget is next year. And as long as the stakeholders and everyone and the legislature and the governor, everyone agrees to that, that gives us some sense of what the future is. And if these initiatives generate a cost of growth that's less than what um, uh, we need and what's allowed, this gives us an opportunity to reinvest that savings uh, into new initiatives, uh, into payments to providers, uh, into a variety of different uh, efforts. But really the question is, so if the savings accrues, how do we reinvest it? And what I've um, basically been saying is that there's really kind of two approaches to that. Uh, option one is what I would call it sort of the global shared savings, which is that we, the state, uh, have the savings accrue to us, and then we come up with mechanisms to share that savings out. Um, lots of ways that share savings could be shared out. Uh, you could make it direct payments from the state to providers or require managed care plans to make direct payments to providers. Those payments could be linked to performance. Those payments could be linked to um, the need, the vital need of certain providers in the community. In fact, we already have a program like this called the Vital Access Provider Program. It's only got about $150 million associated with it, but we could certainly grow that program. Um, I think that there's a lot of different thoughts about how we could potentially reinvest these savings to get providers uh, money out to the provider community, particularly those providers who are gonna see the drop in revenue as we keep people out of uh, more institutional settings. Uh, in addition, uh, you could, instead of running payments out to providers, you could um, invest in new services to the population. Uh, this is certainly the model we're pursuing in behavioral health, and we know we do not have enough community-based options. Um, and so that's also a potential under the global savings approach. Next is managed care shared savings. This would be one where we'd require the plans to come up with shared savings agreements with their providers. Um, the potential benefit of this approach is that um, the healthcare delivery system in Nassau County is not the same as the healthcare delivery system in the southern tier, the North Country, or in, in Buffalo. 
Uh, and so as a result, what works best here may not be what works best in other parts of, uh, of the state. And one thought would be that we would allow plans to submit to the state uh, shared savings agreements that in turn could be implemented assuming the state approves them. Shared savings at this level could take on a variety of different forms. Uh, and some of this actually is already happening, where we could have providers who agree to work on a subcapitation basis. In fact, we already have um, hospital, large hospital systems, including North Shore LIJ, uh, where most of their revenue is coming through shared savings or subcapitation arrangements. Uh, we could encourage, if not require, more of that uh, to occur. Um, and as a result, um, use the shared savings, in essence, as a way to really just better align incentives in healthcare delivery um, and, um, and really potentially make sure that all the actors in the system are benefiting as we begin uh, to really effectively bend the cost curve. The one concern we have and why this discussion around shared savings is so important is that we have a very stressed delivery system uh, that has historically lived off of some of the inefficiency in the Medicaid program. Um, the fact that we spend twice the national average on a per, per recipient basis and rank 50th in the country prior to MRT and inappropriate hospitalizations, um, while not good for patients uh, and not good for taxpayers, uh, did mean that there was more money in the healthcare delivery system uh, and that meant there was an ability to support more infrastructure. But as we begin to take money out of the system, as we begin to move patients into alternative settings, that infrastructure remains. It's a key reason we believe the waiver is so important because that's an opportunity for us to really change the delivery system to really phase out unnecessary infrastructure but at the same time replace it with uh, essential services in communities. But I think what you're seeing in Brooklyn is what um, our fear is, is that uh, we have to be very careful as we take money out of the system that we don't do it in inappropriate ways that shakes an entire community's uh, healthcare delivery to, uh, to its core. But that's why it's important that we figure out, um, and I'm not saying you can do both. You could do a more global approach in certain areas, but then also do a managed care uh, savings agreements, uh, which is certainly what we are pursuing um, within the FIDA demonstration. Question number two, how should Medicaid partner with the exchange in healthcare purchasing? Um, the exchange uh, will be operating somewhere between, I'd say, 600,000 to maybe a million people, uh, although we'll have to watch very closely to see how it goes. Fa certain factors could keep that number lower, certain factors could get, drive that number higher, um, but it will be a significant coordinator of care, uh, and, and depending on how you define purchaser, purchaser of care uh, for um, a New York State. Uh, the, the New York Department of Health um, is responsible for the exchange. Uh, New York Department of Health is responsible for the Medicaid program. And so one of the questions is, are there ways that we could coordinate between the two uh, programs to drive a similar set of incentives to providers? And I think the example I would give here is patient-centered medical homes. The state uh, puts money behind its effort to encourage more primary care practices to get nationally credited uh, in ways that um, evidence shows improves quality and lowers costs. Um, what could we extend that effort by getting other public purchasers or the exchange to adopt similar policies so that more and more of the provider community has a direct incentive or, re or reward from participating in such a program? Particularly, I think, a potentially exciting idea, but one that also uh, makes people concerned, nervous. I know there's a lot of providers out there worried that the exchange uh, will create an environment where they will turn uh, down rates to providers, uh, and if the state tries to leverage uh, its, its collective purchasing power with the exchange, state employees, um, as well as Medicaid, that you could get into, a, and Medicare through the Duals Integration Initiative, that you could see the state trying to basically drive out cost savings in ways that is very uh, uh, problematic for the provider community. So these are all important questions. They have trade-offs to them. But that's why I put them out there, but it, it's gonna beg the question as the exchange gets rolled out and stabilized, now that you've got these two programs, how do you make sure that they're not working certainly across purposes? Question number three, how can Medicaid leverage uh, advances in IT to improve outcomes and lower costs? New York has a long established system of measuring managed care performance uh, that relies heavily on what's called encounter data, or in essence claims data that is gathered by the state. We then use that data and we supplement it with some other data sources to evaluate the effectiveness of managed care plans. 
Uh, that NCQA um, a credit, uh, study that I mentioned looked at that same data from plans from across the country uh, and came to its considered determination that we were second best. However, there's data that's available in other sources, including the electronic medical records of many people uh, across the state, that is not mined in as systematic a fashion uh, as is the uh, claims-based data. And the thought is that if we're able to collect that data in a systematic fashion, we could actually come up with a different set of measures, actually more comprehensive true outcomes measures, that uh, really could be um, very uh, helpful uh, in terms of making sure that when we're evaluating the quality of the services provided, we're actually looking at the, what's the patient's actual experience, the patient's actual health status, as opposed to sort of more process type measures which are typically used uh, in, in, uh, in healthcare and, and plan evaluation. This particular area is something that Dr. Shaw, the health commissioner, is a is major proponent of. There's tremendous amount of data in healthcare already, uh, but not all of it is as effectively used uh, as is possible, and there's also some gaps that exist. Uh, and our hope is that as HIT continues to advance, more people have electronic medical records, and those medical records are actually um, uh, interoperable, meaning that we're able to gather information, share information across providers that will be able to use that to further evolve the Medicaid program. So that's it. Uh, a lot has uh, already happened in the last two and a half years. A lot still to be done. Um, but uh, I'm very excited about the progress we're making, uh, and I look forward to questions. Um, that was an incredible tour de force, Mr. Helgerson, and uh, I, I thank you. I just want to, uh, before we go to questions, acknowledge that uh, my colleagues, uh, some more colleagues in government have come, uh, Senator Carl Marcelino and uh, Michelle Schimmel, Assemblywoman from the North Shore, and we have a representative from Assembly of Montesano's office. They actually heard the whole thing, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, we take questions. We have somebody here who can come to you and uh, give a mic, and uh, we can go forward. and. Uh, if you just want to raise your hands. I know you're all shy, especially the people sitting in the back. No one ever has any thought, but I will tell you, you've heard uh, a tremendous overview of what's going on and how it may affect your lives. And just when you think, well, that is so much, you just can't possibly do all of that. Think back to one of the first moves that the MRT recommendations resulted in. And that was the move for pharmacy coverage for those people under Medicaid managed care. And one day in December 1st, 2012, 3 million people moved from state direct provision to Medicaid managed care. 3 million in this state. And it was all accomplished, accomplished with a minimum of uh, disruption. So th these uh, very, very uh, large challenges which are ahead, which are really fact-based and really need to be addressed, um, will be things that will be moving forward. That being said, uh, questions, and we can see if anybody is shy. Go ahead. Hello, good morning, um, Mr. Helgeson. My name is Tanyella Harrison. I'm the director of Tri-County Home Nursing Services. We have an office in Westbury and Quorum, and I'm actually third generation. My grandmother started the agency, okay. and under the auspices of um, the MRT um, wanting to be patient-centered and continue to have a choice for um, clients and patients. Um, we're finding it hard in this Medicaid transition to basically stay afloat and to keep in business because of all of the changes and the different ways that the managed care organizations are paying us with authorizations, not coming in a timely manner, and just being paid over 30 days with the managed care organizations, and I think that through this change, you need to be centered on the providers that are providing the care for the, for the patients. Another point to address is that in Nassau and Suffolk County, we already had living wage laws here. And so now with this living wage parity law, it's actually making um, us have to pay our caregivers less. And these are caregivers that have been working with us for years. For example, in Nassau County, it's up to, it should have been up to $15 an hour in Nassau County with the living wage law starting August 1st. But with the living wage parity law, it's 1035. And so you have caregivers that are gonna make less money with this um, living wage parity law here. <laughs> and we're not getting the monies 
in our rates. Some of the managed care organizations are saying that they're only going to pay the transitional rates until the end of December. And there's no guarantee at that after those dates that they're going to renegotiate with us. And so I think that you need to keep an eye on making sure that the providers get the money so that we can make sure our staff is paid. Sure. A, c a couple of issues. First off, on the transition issues, definitely we've heard from um, home care providers uh, who have tra transitioned from one payer to um, multiple payers that there have been issues around uh, the timeliness of the payments being made. And I think there's a special work group uh, that uh, was engaged to work through those issues and they continue to work through them. Um, but uh, what we are willing to do is if there are providers who are facing significant cash flow problems and some of them have, have approached us, we'd be happy to sit down. There are things we can do on the fee-for-service side uh, to provide some cash flow relief, uh, if that's helpful, if that's necessary. But at the bottom line is that uh, those are all temporary mechanisms. What we have to do is get to a situation where the provider can build the plan, and the plan can then uh, uh, get that, that bill paid. Uh, it's a sort of a two-way street between the provider and the plan. Both, both sides have to, to get it right. Um, but that's something we are uh, committed to, to getting done here very quickly. Uh, on your comments on the living wage, that's the first time I've ever heard that the living wage is going to drive down wages, um, but I'm happy to look into it. I usually hear the reverse, or what you second said, which was is that it's going to put a lot of pressure on the providers because the wage is higher. Uh, our belief was that as we, um, as part of MRT, was that as we were generating savings in terms of a more appropriate utilization of home care services, we wanted to make sure we were not building a program of home community-based care on the backs of poorly paid workers. So certainly our goal with the living wage uh, law was to make sure that the wages were um, quote unquote livable wages. Uh, and that's when we're, we're gonna f face in April of next year, sort of the last stage of implementation of that law. Um, what we've been clear with, with, with our health plans, who are where most of the work here now is done in those areas where the living wage occurs, that, um, that we have to have rates for managed long-term care that are adequate to meet the, uh, the living wage requirements, and that the plans have to, in turn, pay their providers an adequate amount. And what we right now have is a policy that requires that the plans pay, and that's what you mentioned, the uh, end of this year policy, uh, that could be extended if, if it's deemed necessary, um, that they would pay the existing rates that uh, providers have been used to. Um, but I, you know, I, I certainly, we see the living wage not as a uh, mandatory wage, but not, and actually, if anything, as a, as a floor, it becomes a floor. Uh, so I, I don't think there should be anything in the living wage that should require you to lower your wages to your workers. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to look into that, because as I said, that's the first time I've ever heard that before. Thank you. Um, I'm John Castan. I'm the president of the New York State Council of Community Bayville Healthcare and executive director of Peninsula Counseling Center here on Nassau County. Um, Thank you for laying things out. I, I'm, I'm concerned that um, I know there are a lot of unanswered uh, responses from uh, uh, from the federal government around the, the waiver and some of the details and some of the things that you'd like to do. In the meantime, the uh, behavioral health community um, has been significantly underfunded, particularly in terms of overhead and administration and capital. Uh, we're way behind hospitals in terms of um, the HIT, um, the inter interoperability and connectivity that's really needed to be uh, prepared for the, 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 the scenarios that you describe is really not there. I mean, in many cases, agencies are just on the brink. And I guess I'm concerned that, that by the time the money will be available for reinvestment back into the system, that that system will in fact be um, even more uh, vulnerable and, and fragile. And, just wondering what can be done to try to um, get some infusion of, of capital and some uh, relief to that system so that right now um, we can continue to uh, you know, help achieve some of the, the goals that you've laid out, which are obviously, I think, things that we all agree with, but um, are concerned about our, our, our viability. Um, HIT is just one example, but it's a significant one. There's also other issues related to cash flow and just uh, even ability to you know, give uh, increases to staff who haven't had increases in, in several years because rates have been flat. 
Sure. Um, uh, excellent points. Um, you know, we're well aware that there are vital providers out there that are in very f fragile uh, situations. I, you know, I think the thing is, is that um, sort of in terms of uh, relief, I think the waiver is extremely important. I mean, we're still hoping to have uh, the waiver approved by the end of the calendar year. It's ambitious, but uh, we think that, I mean, certainly we tell the federal government is that, um, um, you know, we, we can't have it delay too much longer. Uh, but that's one source of investment capital. So one area to assist um, uh, the uh, behavioral health provider community uh, is through health homes, uh, which obviously is a major strategy that's focused on the behavioral health um, members with significant behavioral health needs. I mean, that's a major target population for that. And one of the challenges that health, uh, health homes have is that, as you say, the behavioral health providers have been sort of left out of previous HIT investments. Uh, there was a significant investment under uh, the um, uh, recovery funds, the um, uh, stimulus dollars that were approved a couple of years ago uh, that invested a lot of money in hospitals and clinics and, uh, uh, you know, for primary care providers and things like that, large group practices saw money, but it has not, um, it was, their money was not extended to the behavioral health provider community. Uh, and so, um, but what we are asking for in the waiver is to implement uh, establishment grants, uh, significant establishment grants for health homes that hopefully will level the playing field and bring uh, to behavioral health providers HIT resources that they've never had before. In fact, some of our most successful health homes have been ones where the state previously had invested through a HEAL grant uh, into a provider, in, in those cases usually a hospital system, uh, monies around uh, an HIT solution that then that provider was then able to extend uh, to the other members of its health home network in a fairly uh, low cost fashion. But those health homes that haven't benefited from that find it much more challenging and much more paper intensive to share information and, and they just don't have the, the, the wherewithal. Um, that said, at the same time, while we're not ban putting all our eggs in the basket of the waiver, uh, Greg Allen, who's our health home lead, is also uh, exploring whether or not we could create ourselves uh, a new portal uh, off of our data warehouse that, um, uh, where we could potentially get 9010 funding and extend that portal out to the broader provider community uh, so that uh, providers of varying types could have access to a much more comprehensive set of information, especially it would be very exciting is if that information could also be fed with the data coming right out of uh, electronic medical records so you'd have a comprehensive source that we could, in essence, build uh, with uh, design input from the provider community, but could be extended at, uh, at almost no or at no cost to providers um, you know, into their uh, clinical settings. So I think that that's important. The last thing I'll say about uh, behavioral health is that um, I personally think that uh, if we do it right, um, that behavioral health integration uh, has the potential uh, to be a, tr a tremendous uh, financial relief to the behavioral health provider community. Uh, we need more behavioral health, community-based behavioral health services than we have do, than we do today, uh, and that's a simple fact. There are people who are not getting those services, who are costing us lots and lots of dollars, and we need. And part of the reason they're not getting those services is there aren't enough of them in, in, in enough communities. So, but what we need to do is create a framework whereby which monies can transfer from elsewhere in the system as the as shavings has occurred back into those behavioral health services. And I think there's more than enough money in this system of Medicaid in New York where we spend more than twice the national average on a per recipient basis. There's more than enough money that if we do it smart, we can actually make some investments. In the, but the one final thing I'd say on that is that, and this is I think a broader point I, I like to make, which is the idea about higher rates, about higher fee-for-service rates. What I want to encourage all of you who are providers in the room is to start thinking about um, ways in which you'd like to get paid that are different than I provide a unit of service, I get paid for that unit of service. We need to move beyond that thinking. We need to start pushing the envelope so that we can say, okay, if I am doing my job to keep this person well, to keep this person uh, in the appropriate set of services, I'm providing high quality of care, uh, and in fact, in some cases, if I'm generating greater savings, I want to be able to be paid and incented to do that kind of work and rewarded for doing that work as opposed to just providing units of service. Uh, and that's the mentality we sort of want to get out of overall.
Thank you for this, and thank you, Senator Hannon. I have to tell you, this has really been excellent for me. I've been hold I'm a legislator. I've been holding on by my fingernails in terms of understanding all that's going on. But, and I'm torn with the entire process. I do believe in so many areas, not just health, education. We are in a re time of a revolution, if you will. Evolution is over. And I support that because as I see my constituents aging and they're uh, trending towards unhealthy behavior, myself included, just had my third cup of coffee. Um, one thing that I am concerned about is as we streamline the system, the best practice models, and it sounds like it's a best practice model, but I used to be in healthcare. I worked at the mothership at North Shore Hospital. Every patient is so different, and I work with, in the vascular <laughs> surgery area, which is the most brittle of all type patients. To streamline the process, rather than focusing on a patient care, is it a patient care model or is it a system care model? There is so much disparities between the way you deal with patient, and I'm concerned about the formularies established uh, in terms of getting to that care. And I worry also as a former healthcare provider, I don't even have a question, but the, as a healthcare provider, how do we retain and keep them in business if they know that it's, it's so hard? Um, there's a bill floating around now, and, and my, the members know about it, in terms of making sure that there's enough staffing for the nurses, for all the healthcare, you know, ratio, and I know I hear from the providers they're hysterical with that global cap, but at the same token as someone who had to give up the profession because I couldn't lift patients anymore, you know, to make sure that the providers on the one hand, and I'm talking about the first responders on the floor, can get the necessary staffing and the machinery they need to provide the care for the most brittle patients. But at the same token, you have hospitals and nursing homes that are faced with caps. How do you reconcile that unless you go by a patient care model rather than an outcome general base model? That's, that's the, the disparity that I have, that they are disparate because it's, it, this is the toughest thing that we're facing in terms of healthcare. I don't even know if you could answer that question, but. That, that how do you assure the providers as well as the patients that this can be done? Right. I, you, I think you make a number of excellent points. I, I think that what we're seeing now in healthcare is that uh, we've reached the breaking point where roughly about 17% of total GDP is going into healthcare, about twice the, uh, the next uh, level for an industrialized country uh, in the world. Um, I think that the broader uh, economic actors, the business community, those who are purchasing healthcare services, have uh, gotten to the point now where um, that that level of a total income going into healthcare is we just we cannot afford to allow that growth to continue unabated. And um, I think we're at a crossroads uh, in healthcare, and I think that crossroads is that uh, there's sort of two paths we can go on. Um, and I, I don't think that the path of 18, 19, 20, 21 percent, I don't think that's a path that we'll go on. I think we'll go one of two ways. Either one, we go the revolutionary route you described, which is where we fundamentally change how we deliver healthcare to make it much more patient-centric, to have systems who are of, of care rewarded for keeping people well, keeping people in the community, using care that's appropriate, or we go continue to go down the path we've been on, which is we don't incentivize providers uh, to actually keep people healthy. We actually pay them more and more money based on them individuals in their communities using more and more and more expensive services. And I think to a great extent in the United States, we get the healthcare system uh, that we pay for. Uh, we pay for the most expensive system, and I think it's because uh, the, our, our payment methodologies have rewarded volume over value. And I think we got to fundamentally change that, and that's what we're trying to do in Medicaid. And I think as we bring Medicare, and as I mentioned, we need to, as multi-payer world, uh, not only with the Affordable Care Act, but also with the big businesses who will continue to be payers uh, in this world that we need to work together to create that right set of incentives to encourage providers to work together as teams uh, to keep people healthy and create financing systems that reward providers when that actually occurs. And I think that's the, as I, you know, the, the thing that has always uh, stuck in, in my brain was that uh, when I was a Medicaid director uh, in Wisconsin, we had a young, a young doc uh, who we hired as a, uh, uh, our chief medical officer, and he worked part-time at, at the university, he was a nephrologist. For those of you who are aware of what nephrologists do, they work with people with uh, uh, end-stage renal disease, you know, very, 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 some of our most complicated patients. Nephrologists are probably some of the smartest 
uh, doctors you'll, you'll, you'll find uh, because the, the science they deal with is extremely very, very complicated. Uh, and uh, what he told me once was that the issue, Jason, you have to realize is that um, uh, I get paid more the sicker my patients are. And I, to me, as long as that is the case in America, we are going to have an inefficient health care delivery system that's going to cost us too much money. And we got to find a way to change that. And the only way we're going to do that is if we can fundamentally change the payment incentives where we actually reward the providers for people keep, keeping people well. And I think if we can find a way to do that, and we've done it in other sectors of the economy, I mean, uh, where actually over time unit costs go down, the quality improves, um, and I think we can be done, but we, we collectively need to make that happen. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Robin Marks. I'm with Amber Court Assisted Living, which is in Westbury. Uh, we have some other locations, too. Each of our locations has a Medicaid-funded assisted living program, or whatever the equivalent is in that location. And it is a blessing of a program. It's not well known that uh, it exists, and it makes assisted living affordable for people who shouldn't be living on their own. Um, we haven't heard anything addressed this is a cost-effective and quality-of-life effective program. We're hoping that uh, we're sparing people from going to nursing homes prematurely or unnecessarily, and we don't know what the view is going forward in terms of how this reconciles with the future of the health care delivery system. Absolutely. Um, assisted living, I think, is a very important part of the whole health care continuum. Um, and in fact, we have an initiative that we're, it's underway to potentially roll out an additional 5,000 ALP beds, Medicaid ALP beds across the state. Um, our thought is that at the end of the day, uh, we want individuals, particularly as we see the baby boom generation aging into long-term care, we need there to be a greater continuum of options. Uh, I believe nursing homes will continue to be necessary in the future. And in fact, I see the role of nursing homes fundamentally changing, being much more about care coordination and keeping people out of hospitals and things like that, which I think they're potentially well positioned for a subset of the population. But I think for others, um, as, we, as the baby boom generation ages, we're going to need to find uh, lower cost options for those who don't need 24-hour nursing. Uh, and there's a great continuum out there of people in terms of long-term care needs. And we need to make sure that that full continuum is available. And I think one of the areas in New York we need to greatly expand is assisted living. Thank you. I'm Assemblyman Dave McDonough, and I'm a member of the Health Committee in the Assembly. Thank you for being here, and thank you, Senator Hannon. A couple of years ago, we had a hearing, and this is more addressed to the cost savings of Medicaid in Albany, in which the Medicaid Inspector General testified. And he talked about the savings that they are trying to recover through fraud, waste, and abuse. And at that time, it was estimated that the fraud, waste, and abuse in New York State could be four to five billion dollars. And I'm wondering, do you have an update on the progress on uh, that recovery system and the Medicaid Inspector General program? Sure. Sure. So um, I think uh, overall, um, the Medicaid Inspector General program has been very successful. I think despite uh, some of press reports or uh, uh, certain congressional committees, uh, I think that it's actually been um, a model for the country in the sense that, uh, and I, I've seen it both ways. When I was the Medicaid director in Wisconsin, I had the Medicaid fraud abuse under my purview. Here I do not. Um, and I see uh, Jim Cox, who's the current Medicaid Inspector General, as a great partner. What I can tell you is, um, from my view, uh, as my number one performance measure to the, to the governor is the global spending cap that we have to live within. Uh, and uh, that uh, it makes me very sensitive to whether or not uh, the collections of the Inspector General uh, are consistent with what uh, was assumed uh, for budgetary purposes. Uh, in each and every year that we've been, in the last two years, we've been under the global spending cap and continuing into this year, uh, the office has continued to hit those projections. Uh, and to give you a sense is that uh, their projections are primarily focused on the fee-for-service program, which as we talked about is declining in size, uh, and they're actually going through a major rethink in terms of what role the man uh, Office of the Medicaid Inspector General will play uh, in managed care, which is going to be an interesting thing because to a great extent that we expect those managed care partners of ours to prevent fraud and abuse in the first place, one of the things we pay them to do. 
Uh, so as more and more of the service array goes there, um, it's going to require us to do a change. Um, but I think overall the state is well served by the model. Um, and uh, you know, it's a big complicated program with lots of actors, 100,000 providers. Uh, there's never going to be a situation where there is no fraud and abuse. But I think we need to strive to keep those numbers absolutely as low as we can. And I think the global cap forces us to be ever more vigilant uh, when it comes to making sure that fraud and abuse isn't out of control in our state. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eli Knoll. I'm with uh, Berkshire Nursing Home West Babylon. Uh, shifting to the long-term uh, care facilities that take care of the aging population, the baby boom, and as they get more important. When we deal with the managed care companies, specifically the dual eligibles, a great issue in any facility is that part of their process in reducing their rates towards the providers is by limiting who they're willing to add to their network. And in doing so, we don't have access into their networks for our communities that we've been serving for 50, 60 years. And they will not negotiate with new people. Part of their pitch to who they're in contract with is we will give you lower rates but on the flip side, we have the people in our network and we can direct them to only you. So you have, let's say in a, in a long-term care facility, we can have, we're, we're right at the border of Nassau, Suffolk, there are two facilities within a half hour drive either, each direction that are under the networks of some of the biggest providers. And on a second issue, when you're talking about two eligible under managed care, their, their pitch, is to, their incentive is to limit the Medicare spending on hospitalizations and on skilled, uh, skilled care days, which under Medicare is part A. And one of the issues with that is that Medicaid, the rates do not, the revenue does not grease the wheel. There is no money to be made based on how the formula is computed to raise any revenue from Medicaid stays. And in limiting the Medicare days, Again, one of their incentives is to say, we will put a nurse practitioner full time on their bill or the such, and we will help limit hospitalizations, which sounds like a beautiful way of having efficient quality care. However, in facilities that are currently providing such efficient quality care with low hospitalization rates and people staying healthy, they cannot offer any incentive to make a contract with them and become part of the network. They literally will tell you in negotiation, and I can say from, from experience, they tell you we cannot prov provide you anything because in instead of sharing the savings, our pitch to you in why you should contract with us is that we will help you fill the beds by pe keeping people from the hospital. But if you're already providing it, they want nothing to do with you because they cannot earn their own revenue in the cost saving of healthcare that they could share with you. So I wanna know what, if it's being addressed and what ideas are out there to ensure that the providers, specifically of subacute skilled care and long-term care, can have to ensure both equal and equitable access to these managed care networks. Sure, so two things on that. Um, first off, um, we are in the process of working through with a big stakeholder group um, all the issues that you have raised. So we have yet to sort of finalize on some of these things, but I can give you a flavor for what you will see uh, because the nursing home benefit, our, our current proposal is beginning in January 1st. Uh, new uh, individuals in terms of those needing um, um, uh, institutional level of care, long-term institutional level of care, uh, will be enrolled into managed long-term care plans, uh, as well as if you're Medicaid only into a mainstream managed care plan, uh, starting on January 1st. That's not the existing population, but any new enrollee would begin in that process. So uh, in the run-up to that, uh, which is obviously not that far away, six months or less, less, five months, that um, with these work groups are trying to grapple with those issues. But two things. First off, on network adequacy, the state has requirements in its contracts um, around what constitutes an adequate network. Plans are required to offer patients choices uh, in their communities. Uh, 
And so one of the ways that we can help protect the providers is through those adequacy uh, requirements. And that way then, it's not just a plan that dictates where a person goes uh, in terms of which nursing home they and their family choose. It's also a uh, uh, family or member choice uh, that will play a role in dictating uh, well, where individuals are going to grow, so go. So there's there's going to be those network adequacy requirements. The other thing on the rates issue, which is interesting to me, is that plans offering you lower rates. Uh, we've been pretty clear. Maybe this hasn't gotten down to all of the contract uh, folks in in the plans, um, but we've been pretty clear that there are going to there's going to be a two year uh, window during which uh, managed care companies are going to have to pay the fee for service rate. Uh, the existing state rate that's paid. That will have to be done for a two-year transition period. One exception is if uh, nursing homes and the plans, uh, a plan, come to us with an alternative mechanism, which actually we prefer, because uh, what we want is we want there to be shared savings agreements, but if a plan wants out of that, uh, that uh, fee-for-service requirement, they're gonna have to come with their, the homes and their network to us with a plan that both sides agree to. So in a sense, that'll give the nursing homes some flexibility that, uh, and some leverage in their negotiations with the plans uh, to be able to say that, hey, if we can work together on a shared savings agreement uh, that works for both sides, uh, we could uh, come up with a way that uh, the plan's better off and the homes are better off. Uh, I believe at, at the end of the day, there's a tremendous opportunity to manage care for nursing homes. I think that there are individuals who are cycling in and out of nursing homes today that are generating tremendous costs to the system. Most of that's Medicare costs because they're, most are duals. That um, we can, within a managed care framework, uh, keep in the system, uh, keep uh, with providers uh, that uh, will mean at the same time lower costs and uh, better payments to providers for services rendered also uh, will mean a better quality of life for, those, for that population. Uh, so I think there's a great potential here, but I mean, obviously there are, there are issues and, uh, and the transition that we got to work through. Hi. Hi. My name is Veronica Bensavanga, and I work for Haran Martel and Marone. Um, we represent about 70 nursing homes throughout New York State. And my question, I think, is similar in nature, but um, slightly different than the gentleman's question prior, which is, the portability that many insureds had before regarding their insurances, not having to be in network or out of network, but really just having to find a Medicaid and Medicare certified, certified participating provider, um, allowed flexibility to find a facility near a family member who might be more involved during their convalescence, whatever period of time that might be. So I think there's definitely some concerns in that area about no longer having that flexibility where if my mom lives in Queens, but I know there's a great rehab facility near me in Smithtown, I'd like her to come there so that I can participate actively because of my busy schedule, work, kids, whatever it might be. Right. That's one concern. Um, and I think that if there's any willing provider rules, that helps allay some of that fear because then I know even if my mom or my father or my grandparents need to go out of network, I know that I can approach a local provider and say this is the insurance and if this is the right place and this makes the most sense for the plan of care for my loved one that we can indeed contract with the insurer. So that's one question about participation. So even if I'm not getting a regular flow, my family member can get care where it's going to suit them best for family participation. Um, that's one item. The second item, which was actually my original one, was um, I think a lot of skilled nursing facilities have a certain um, uncertainty because this is new territory for them. And so I'm wondering what assistance the state might provide, um, although I know we will develop some of our own, but what assistance will they provide regarding the option number two you had mentioned, which is the managed care shared savings? I think we're all very interested in that because for a long time, um, skilled nursing providers have been concerned about having to maintain the lower scoring individuals because there weren't those home and community-based services to support them upon re-entry so we've just kind of been hanging on to them so we're actually happy that we now are going to have some supports in the community to divert them to um, but at that same token that means that the acuity of the patients that we're going to be maintaining going forward either permanently or in short-term spurts is going to be much higher than the acuity that we have now so the medicaid rates that you're guaranteeing aren't gonna be sufficient to cover that acuity level as it grows, and we've already seen it increase significantly um, as the census has gotten softer for our industry, and the care level has gotten much higher. 
So we're interested in learning more and being better at the managed care shared savings, but a lot of the contracts don't include that acuity component, and even when we start working with them to try to get it, um, they're not as comfortable providing it, and maybe that's a they need to learn and we need to learn, but how right. are you gonna help us, I guess, navigate those waters as well? Sure, I, it's clear that it's, this is all new for the plans too. And so, I mean, managed long-term care plans uh, have more experience, they've had contracts with, um, for the dual eligible population, have had contracts with nursing homes for long periods of time, but they haven't had to rely heavily on nursing homes. As I mentioned, only 2% of their population is in nursing homes, so it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it has not been as uh, significant, um, but it's gonna become a lot more significant. Um, we anticipate by the end of calendar year 14, Roughly 25% of the total nursing home population will be enrolled in plans, uh, and that by the end of the second year, you're going to be starting to approach, you know, the 80% threshold. And by the end of the third year, you start getting closer and closer to 100% uh, of the population will be in plans. So um, we we have maybe a little bit of time here, but I think that uh, one of the reasons for doing the fee for service rates. Uh, for two years was to provide a transition to an alternative, uh, alternative multiple uh, um, mechanisms uh, for reimbursement, recognizing that uh, not all providers are the same or communities are the same, so that one size fits all doesn't necessarily work. But that said, we're committed to trying to bring plans. In fact, we came one of the. I was at the last. Um, larger group meeting of this of these multiple work groups that have been on the, managing the nursing home transition and and, um, and one of the things that came out of that was a better need for both sides to understand the business of you know the other so it's I think an opportunity for us to facilitate that now the issue around uh, open access and uh, any willing provider I think at the end of the day uh, any willing provider doesn't lead to the kind of integrated care that we want because if we, we want nursing homes to partner with plans in ways that make it reasonable for both uh, to uh, have um, a coherent approach to shared savings, a coherent approach to care management. The fear about uh, any willing is that you could be a plan that has a disparate uh, set of co-contracts where you have one-off relationships between one provider and a um, uh, one provider and a and the plan, but where there's very little incentive for either parties to do care coordination, which I think at the end of the day is not what we want. But you do make a good point, which is for particularly for short-term care, uh, like on the Medicare rehab benefit, taking into account family choice and uh, family's location, which isn't always the same community where the individual has been living, uh, that uh, maybe there's uh, some advantage uh, to allowing some outer network uh, participation for that type of care, and I think that's something we can give very serious consideration to. Hi, my name is Maureen Dolan. I'm the controller of South Shore Home Health Services. Excuse my voice, I have a cold. Um, we have been in business for 27 years. Uh, 27 years ago, two RNs started um, an agency. We are very patient-driven. We have programs in place to keep patients out of the hospital, UTIs, telemedicine, which we're not reimbursed for. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years. That's just two of many. Having said that, uh, I hope you're aware that the MLTCs and the MCOs are negotiating very low rates, 15 to $18 an hour will not cover our cost. Uh, the cost of our employees, as you've heard, Nassau County's rates are 1521. Uh, $15 an hour won't cut it, doesn't even cover their salary, no less their direct cost and overhead. Um, the other thing, the second thing um, that I'd like to make you aware of is our cost report. We're doing, our, we're currently doing a cost report. It's very antiquated. They took, um, the uh, formulas are antiquated. They took trend factors, everything out of it. Our rates are down to 2006 rates. Obviously, we're in 2013, going into 2014. Um, I was wondering if we would consider regional rates. Um, Long Island's rates are, uh, cost of living is a little higher than upstate. Manhattan, you know, across the board, our rates are all different if you would consider regional rates. Is there regional One, rates for, for re what service? For CHA home care, or? Home care services. Okay, so personal care? Personal care services. Okay. Um, also, 
Uh, what about the 2% take back? Our rates are at 2006 rates currently. Um, you take 2% off, off the top, you give it to us, take it back. When is that ending? Is it going to end? Is it going to become a tax? We also do an assessment uh, fee monthly on the rest of our business. So we're paying, you know, more than 2% back to the state. Is that going to stop? Sure, I can answer that one. The answer is yes. Um, the uh, idea is that uh, this is one of the ways that we hope to share our savings back. I could have mentioned that before, is that, um, uh, but we did announce when we went through the process of the, the um, solving the DD problem that our desire is um, either at the very tail end of this fiscal year, so really not that far away, so March of, of two, 2014, but definitely effective April of 2014, our plan is to basically uh, eliminate the 2% across the board production, which was the final, sort of the final piece in achieving that $4 billion in savings that we were asked to find. So, um, but our goal, and I, I think it would be a great legacy, is that that was, of all the pieces that we moved forward with, that was the one really that wasn't tied to any reform or sort of policy objective, but rather just a way to generate savings. Uh, and I think we are on the cusp of potentially um, eliminating that, um, that reduction, uh, which obviously I think will be beneficial to all providers who have, have, have faced it. Um, in terms of some of your, your other issues, um, I mean, I think that clearly what's happening in the move to mandatory managed long-term care is negotiations ongoing between the providers and uh, the plans and, um, and the discussions around rates and reimbursement. Uh, what we're definitely encouraging is we want, um, we want providers and plans to think more globally about what, what uh, contractual relationships they can have rather than just focusing entirely on the rate uh, for services in a fee-for-service environment. But I understand that's a two-way street. And, uh, but I do think that um, you know, it is one of those things we're going to have to work through. But the plans, I have to be clear, are, are required. And I think the providers sometimes think they have less leverage than, than, um, uh, than, than they might think with these providers. Because right now, you are the service provider for these individuals. These individuals who are enrolled in managed long-term care can at any point switch plans. So if you have a con if you, you have a managed long-term care plan that refuses to sign a contract with you because they're only offering to pay you um, a rate that's inefficient for you to stay operating as a home care provider, but you have a contract with another, per another plan, you could certainly um, tell the people you're serving that unless they're willing to change plans, it's still the patient's choice, that they may have a situation where they may have to change providers. And my impression, uh, based on our experience in this to date, is that individuals want to stay with their provider. If they're happy with the person who's in their home on a daily basis providing them with home care services, they don't want to lose that relationship because that's a relationship of trust. And the plan's got to be real careful uh, not to try to negotiate too hard a bargain uh, because if they do, they could lose membership. Down. Our employees' rates are going to have to go down. There is no way, even at the higher end, and I've, I've been talking to a number of providers, um, even at the high end, they're going to go from $15 an hour to $10.35. And we cannot, they will not budge over $18 an hour. I mean, they're some of the better providers. A lot of them are coming in at $15. Uh, I, I don't know how you can work with that. You can't pay fifteen twenty one an hour when you're getting fifteen dollars from your provider. So um, you know, this is back to that living wage question about why the wages are going down when the living wage ordinance or law was designed to raise wages. But I will look to see if there's something unique in Nassau County that's. Uh, that's... Oh, yes, sir. It's Suffolk and Westchester. Okay, but we'll look into that. Yep. Hello. Still good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Kemp, for making this possible. I'm Senator Carl Marcelino. I represent the uh, small but powerful city of Glen Cove. Uh, Glen Cove has recently been informed that its hospital, which is part of North Shore LIJ system, uh, is going to change its method of operation, uh, closing its, uh, its hospital beds. You're not, no longer be able to stay long term there, uh, no more than a 24-hour operation uh, for stabilization review and then uh, shipped over to perhaps Manhasset or some other facility. Uh, this is uh, driven, uh, they claim, uh, 
um, partly through the exchange and partly through the method of reimbursement through the Affordable Care Act. Um, have you heard of this? I, I understand the state has to approve this. I don't know what the status of it is. And uh, what is your opinion on this? Right. Um, hard for me to give an opinion in the sense that I don't have as many facts. Um, and it's actually something that's sort of outside my purview as a Medicaid director. It's uh, elsewhere in the Department of Health. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm being evasive in that. But, uh, but I just think it is something that the state's going to have to take a look at. Obviously, there's concerns in the community about Anytime there's a closure of a hospital or a reconfiguration of services at a, at, a, at a community hospital, what does that mean for access uh, to care? And does uh, those changes um, uh, um, have a negative impact on, on, on care? So I think we'll have to take a very hard look at, uh, at that plan uh, and determine whether or not we think it has an, an impact or not. Uh, and the extent to which it requires um, a action by the health department. Um, uh, on that, we'll have to uh, take a look at it uh, very closely. Um, but I think that the, the, the trend, uh, which we are seeing, and I've said this before, is that uh, there's a trend uh, downward uh, in hospital utilization, uh, which uh, I actually think at the end of the day is a good thing in the sense that uh, it's meaning that there are people who are being served in other settings. Uh, in most cases, those settings are lower cost and are more appropriate to the individual. The downside of that uh, change is it means there's um, uh, more uh, hospital beds, and this is more generally, and I can't speak specifically to, uh, to uh, your community, um, but generally speaking, there are communities across the state where there are excess beds. I, I know the statistics in Brooklyn the best, uh, given the situation, but on any given day in the borough of Brooklyn, roughly 40% of nursing home be or, uh, hospital beds are empty. And that's not a recipe for financial sustainability if you're running these large institutions with fixed costs, um, if you can't, um, if you can't you know, uh, keep those beds filled. Uh, and so the issue is, is that um, what we need to do is, is have the infrastructure, the delivery system needs to evolve to meet where patients are getting their care or want their care. Um, but that said, we'll take a, um, we, the Department of Health, will take a, a hard look uh, at uh, that particular proposal. and. Um, you know, and develop uh, uh, an opinion, uh, you know, based on the information that's provided. I think. <clears throat> Who we got one over here? Why don't we say, why don't we say it's towards the last question? Because your ability to answer everything. <laughs> but that's fine. Last one. Uh, Mr. Halkerson, I'm from a home care agency that services Nassau, Suffolk, and even the five boroughs now, too. And I think just to shed some more light as far as the you know, fee-for-service rates for Medicaid, as well as the living wage and wage parity, what's happening is we're finding a number of plans that on the second day of service in some cases, a client could have had a PCA through Medicaid and the local Department of Social Services for two, three, or four years. Day two with the MLTC plan, they're saying that it's a home health aid now, no justification for it, and the rate drops about six to seven dollars an hour. So we have aides that have made, you know, 13, 14, 15 dollars now in some of these cases that instantly overnight go down to 1035 and have no uh, idea I see why. I see what we're talking about here. Now it makes more sense to me. So, you know, we've contacted the plans. We've said, listen, you know, Mrs. Jones has had a PCA for 10 years, five years what's happened overnight prior to a nursing assessment even being done by the plan, which is the other side of it too. There's right. no real sense or justification for it. And then to even try and contact somebody at the plan is the other side of it that we're having an issue with. Nursing, billing, there's no communication from the plan side as far as being able to address these issues in a timely manner, especially when you have somebody that's in there providing services every day. It could be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks sometimes before hear from them. Right. So first off, I mean, there are obviously uh, built-in appeals um, rights into state law uh, for individuals who have their service uh, changed. Now, that said, if what the plan's doing is, in essence, deciding, and they need to do this based on a, a nurse's assessment, so the requirement on managed long-term care is within the first 30 days of enrollment, there has to be a face-to-face uh, assessment done of the needs of that particular person. 
Uh, and based on that assessment, you know, if they determine that there's a more appropriate service array that the individual, the individual can decide, yes, I want to do it, uh, or if they don't like that decision, they have appeal rights uh, that eventually could obviously go to an ALJ uh, and could be litigated if, if necessary. But the, but the individual, if, the, if that assessment suggests that there is a lower cost provider, which is, sounds like what you're saying, who could in essence provide the same service. So it's not actually a reduction in services, it's a change in what kind of providers, and as a result of that, the, it's, you end up sending the same provider, but the provider was getting paid $15 an hour, now it's getting paid $10 an hour, because the de determination was that that higher skill set was not necessary, is that? Oh, because of the living wage. It's technically a higher level of service for right. a lower wage because they're only honoring Medicaid transfers. So huh. the flip side of this too is if a client changes from plan A to right. plan B in August or September, the plans also aren't honoring the Medicaid transfer anymore. Hmm. They're stating that it's not a Medicaid right. transfer case, that it's a, a new referral. From so the patient's better off in the sense that the patient's, in theory, getting even a higher level of care. Um, but the, but the it's, and it's the same worker? Yeah, a lot of RAs are you know, TCAs and HHAs. So uh, an HHA can work on a PCA level case, but in theory, that same worker, if it goes to a higher level of care, it's having that rate reduced because they're not considering their Medicaid transfer anymore. It's, it's going down to a, a home health aid. Right, this, but this issue will be resolved when the living wage is implemented, right? Because then the wages on both sides will be equal. So this is a temporary phenomenon where the plan is, if the, because I'm trying to get to make understand, I say is the plans are temporarily, are they, you're implying the plans are temporarily changing the service, or it's not really, the patient's really not impacted because it's the same worker. Right. Transition rate, yeah. and now they're reducing the contracted rate six to seven dollars an hour in some cases, and the aides are directly <coughs> impacted because they're going from the county living right. wage down to New York City's wage parity at ten thirty-five. Sure. So why don't we do this? Why don't you get me a look? If you'd be willing to give me a little bit more information on this, I could look into it because I think this is. Um, you know, one of those unintended consequences that we want to look into a little bit more. Right. Well, that's one of those things we can look at uh, and see we can't close that loophole. So. And honestly, if it happened once or twice, that's understandable, but it's happened numerous times already in the same plan. Sure. Okay. Is it just certain plans or is it? Certain plans. Certain plans. Not surprised. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. How about a large round of applause. <laughs> Jason, I, th I thank you. Um, I thank the question, people who raised questions, because there's a level of detail that you've brought forward as we move through this that's uh, very necessary to address. Um, I want to thank Hofstra. I want to thank the techs back there. We've been watching all the time. Make sure everybody could be heard, and thank you. Can we put you in the slideshow of the web? Absolutely. We'll take this slideshow and we'll put it up on the Senate Health website. We'll also have a reprise of the entire um, uh, presentation there. Mark, thank you for coming down from Albany and, and doing that. As you leave, if you leave us with your email address as we get through to have other uh, events and all of that, we'd uh, love to do it. It's a lot easier to send you an email. And, and finally, just one other thing, was it's amazing uh, you heard um, the grasp of detail and the range of concerns that uh, Mr. Helgerson has. Last week we had uh, Commissioner Shaw down here at the uh, uh, Long Island Association. He talked none of the same topics. He talked about the state's prevention health agenda. 
something else available on the web, something that will drive a lot of where the state's uh, public health and preventive health systems will be going, a major initiative. So there's a lot to be involved in, and I hope uh, everybody can, can take away today uh, a lot better understanding of the breadth and scope of what uh, the state of New York is doing in Medicaid. Thank you. Thank you.